there will still be very tight supply. So between all of those tailwinds, there will be demand increase and price will go up. If you haven't really seen institutional interest start yet. Um, that's most probably going to start coming towards the fall once people see these ETFs stabilize. Listen, there are only about a million Bitcoin left to be mined between now and 2140. You really need to be careful um, as a Bitcoin miner about going down the rabbit hole of HPC. You're seeing some rotation. Um, I think you haven't really seen institutional interest start yet. Um, that's most probably going to start coming towards the fall once people see these ETFs stabilize. People are still trying to figure it out. You know, normally there is a launch of an ETF for a particular commodity. Here you've got all of a sudden a whole graduating class, if you would, of ETFs. And people are still trying to suss out, um, you know, the pros and cons of each one. Obviously, BlackRock has garnered, um, you know, a large percentage um, as has Galaxy. So I think what we're going to see is some balancing out over time. Uh, I don't think it's really taken a lot of people who were before spot holders. Um, I mm -hmm. don't think necessarily Coinbase has lost a lot of uh, customers to these ETFs at this point yet. The whole real objective here is to attract a new class of investors to Bitcoin, people who are, you know, either RIAs or customers of RIAs rather, um, you know, institutions, um, pension funds, 401ks and the like, who don't want to have to deal with custodying Bitcoin. They don't want to have to deal with all of the issues of uh, holding uh, Bitcoin on exchanges or trading it. They just want to be able to buy it through their normal broker. So I think this is something that's going to take a little time. What has been very positive, though, is the volume of trading was very substantial. It's one of the most successful launches of uh, an ETF category um, in history. And if you just look at the sheer volume, uh, it definitely exceeded, you know, the launch of, uh, of gold ETFs. But you're also mm -hmm. seeing a whole slew of new participants uh, applying for things like uh, short ETFs. So to be able to short Bitcoin, to be able to do uh, leverage on Bitcoin, to be able to do sell calls on Bitcoin, things like that. So you're going to see now a whole family of funds come that will allow more and more people to essentially paper trade Bitcoin uh, <laughs> without having to actually hold it. Well, people are looking to generate yield in different ways, right? You have the Joe consumer or boomers like myself who may be in their retirement account want to have some exposure to Bitcoin. If you were to go out and talk to um, RIAs, many of them would say, hey, once there are the right uh, types of instruments out there, yeah, 1% allocation to Bitcoin makes sense. You, know, you can look at whether it's stuff that Fidelity has written or stuff that other investment advisors have written. Um, then as you start going kind of down or rather up the risk curve, you get people who want to trade. So, you know, they don't want to trade in and out using an ETF. They want something with a little more juice. So they might want to use MicroStrategy because of how uh, MicroStrategy uses their balance sheet to buy and hold Bitcoin. Or they may want to invest in miners or they may want to play the futures markets, you know, whether it's perpetual futures. So the more variety, the more options people have, the more interest there is in the market. And the more liquidity there is in the market, the more investors it attracts. And so this is only just going to add to the liquidity. The other important factor here is it's going to make Bitcoin kind of the unassailable king of cryptocurrencies. It's going to be really hard for any other cryptocurrency to get near Bitcoin's um, attractiveness as an investment asset, I think. But over time, what you're going to find is more and more of the traditional brokers uh, are going to let you do this. Charles Schwab, Fidelity, they already let you do it. So... You know, yeah. it's, it's very much um, open season, I think, for these things. Um, but what you are seeing is as relates to the price of Bitcoin, you know, there was a run up in Bitcoin price leading up to the um, announcement. Then it's kind of been selling off on the news. Uh, part of that is also people rotating. You have some people rotating out of Bitcoin into ETH because now they're trying to, you know, run up the ETH uh, ETF rumors and see yeah. where that goes. Uh, I personally think that uh, ETH is going to have a much harder slog becoming approved as an ETF just due to um, Gary Gensler's perspectives on ETH not being as clear as they were on Bitcoin. Plus, there's no lawsuit driving him to do anything there. So yeah. I think that um, you know Bitcoin is going to be the king here. It's going to take a while, but I think that clearly towards the end of this year, we'll see the real impact of the ETF, um, especially after the halving, when we think a number of miners will be in trouble because the price of Bitcoin is clearly not at a place where post-halving, 
um, miners are going to enjoy a uh, good profitability and that strain that low Bitcoin yield is going to put on those miners balance sheets are going to mean some of them are going to have to find options as to how they're going to survive. And part of that is going to be selling the sites that they're running their miners in possibly. Yeah. And if there are attractive deals out there, we will be an acquirer. We're unique in that we have, you know, close to a billion dollars of cash and Bitcoin in our balance sheet that we can go and use to go acquire things before we have to dip into our equity. So uh, I think we're in a very good position to consolidate the industry. Our intention is to, you know, continue to grow. You know, we've stated 50 exahash is our goal for the end of 2025, but that doesn't mean we have to stop there. All the different miner, miners kind of comparing them. And I did notice that Marathon had a substantial amount of cash on hand. And so is that kind of a strategy like to prepare for the halving? Well, so we run our business from a perspective of we need to be resilient, meaning we need to be able to weather whatever storm comes at us. Mm -hmm. And if the price of Bitcoin, let's just say it drops to 30,000 at the time of the halving, not many miners are going to be op able to operate profitably. And how many miners have enough cash on the balance sheet to be able to survive six to 12 months, maybe 24 months before um, it becomes profitable to mine again when Bitcoin has moved back up. Uh, so you need to have a lot of cash on your balance sheet to do that, because if the price of Bitcoin drops, the Bitcoin you have on your balance sheet is going to lose value as well. Right. And if you've just placed big orders for miners, you're going to have to have cash to pay for those orders <laughs> at a time when um, you, know, you will be uh, not having a lot of cash on your balance sheet. So we believe that now is the time to buy capacity because these deals take time to close I and mean, this generate deal. Uh, was a deal that we did very quickly, very efficiently. You know, we started working on this just before Thanksgiving. We closed it last week. Um, you know, that's a speed that you need a very seasoned M&A team to be able to execute with. And thankfully, our team has a lot of experience in M&A. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to stop doing deals post the having. We're just getting started. The question gotcha. right now is you want to buy quality sites. You want to buy sites that have all the attributes that make them attractive. So for example, if I have to go and buy a site, um, no matter how low cost, that is fully occupied with somebody else's miners, and those contracts are gonna run for four years, let's just say the power cost at that site isn't very attractive, then you know, I'm not gonna wanna own that site regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly don't wanna buy people's machines that are running at a site because all those machines are old. Marathon is known for always buying machines at the bleeding edge of the technology curve. You know, we're very technology focused. We're technology fully vertically integrated, even to the extent that we helped um, and funded, you know, Oridine, which is the U.S. designer of uh, Bitcoin mining ASICs. Um, and full disclosure, I sit on the board of the company. Um, you know, the idea there was to design a miner that was built for industrial scale miners like ourselves, where you can tweak the performance of individual ASICs, where you can overclock, underclock, where you can manage them to profitability points and do things you can't do with these standard shoebox miners built by people like Bitmain and others. Um, sovereign nations today are very interested in mining Bitcoin. Why? The U.S. weaponized the U.S. dollar. And so if you as a sovereign want to hold your reserve assets, you don't have many options. The US dollar historically has been the reserve currency of the world because it's a safe haven and you could trust the US to not mess with your dollars. That's not the case anymore. If you're a commodity producer in the Middle East, for example, there's risk that the US may put you on an OFAC list. And then what do you do? Now you can't move money. They may take your reserves uh, like they did with Russia. And I'm not saying they're going to do that with the Middle Eastern country necessarily. But, um, you know, you can look at all these central banks that have been buying gold as a way to hold their reserves instead of dollars. Uh, yeah, and, record you know, amounts. You can go Google this, you know, record amounts. And so now you also have sovereign nations looking at Bitcoin as an alternative to the dollar. The problem is if you're not mining your own Bitcoin and you don't have your own pools, then the U.S., through its OFAC process could block you from accessing markets and getting your transactions mined. You know, look at what some of these pools out there are doing now where they're being rumored of uh, filtering based on OFAC compliance. And yeah. you know, full disclosure, Marathon had a pool operating three years ago where we had that capability, uh, which we shut down um, because there was such an outcry from the industry. Yeah. So the risk for censorship is very high. And so you see nations 
uh, like UAE, who want to operate their own Bitcoin mining, who want to have their own custody, who want to have their own pools, etc., because it gives them sovereignty over their assets. Just like most Bitcoin owners today, one of the key driving purposes behind Bitcoin is self-sovereignty. Well, nations want that. And so now you're starting to see nation states want to mine specifically for that reason. You know, Bhutan, 200 megawatts of power, right? Yes. And growing, oh, you know, yeah. Middle East, lots of countries there very interested in it. Russia is doing it. And you're now starting to see countries in Africa looking at it. You're starting to see nations in Central and South America. Uh, so I think what you're going to continue to see is more and more um, diversity in who's mining. You're going to continue to see hash rate grow because there are people who don't necessarily have a financial profit interest in Bitcoin mining, but have a strategic interest in Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to continue to see global hash rate grow. You're going to see capacity growing on a global basis. You'll see the, the U.S. share of global Bitcoin mining decrease over time. Um, the other thing you're going to see is a growing um, number of micro miners. And this is, gets back to the energy harvesting thing I mentioned earlier. You know, the ability to mine Bitcoin and heat a building at the same time, mine Bitcoin and grow shrimp, mine Bitcoin and heat hothouses. You know, it doesn't need a lot of mining capacity to do that. Right? You're paying for the energy anyway. Why not mine Bitcoin? About 95% of the heat that uh, or energy that you buy to plug a miner in is converted into heat when you mine Bitcoin. If you can capture that heat and use it for something else, you know, think about it. People pay a lot of money to heat buildings. People pay a lot of money to heat greenhouses. There are industrial processes that need low-grade industrial heat for food processing, other things like that. Um, so there are lots of opportunities for people to use small capacity Bitcoin miners uh, to heat things, um, to be a significant share of mining that is micro miners doing simple things like heating where mining Bitcoin is really a byproduct of what they're really doing. What, what, what are you looking at over the next 12 months with just Bitcoin's price? So I think um, you've got a, a number of really good tailwinds. You've got obviously FASB, you have the ETF. Um, you have the having, which granted, it's more of a psychological shock than anything else. Uh, you know, as a supply shock, you're talking about going from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 Bitcoin a day. Um, you know, there are millions of Bitcoin traded a day. So that supply change isn't going to really do a whole lot, but it's the psychology of it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's there are only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. We've mined almost 20 million. The amount of Bitcoin actually in circulation today liquid on exchanges um you know is somewhere between 1.8 million to 3 million depending on the day and what's going on with the etfs that liquidity will increase likely but realize a lot of these etfs once the bitcoin goes in there if somebody's buying shares and somebody is selling shares of the etf that bitcoin doesn't have to circulate anywhere on the blockchain it's just going to stay in the etf like in a corporate wallet at an exchange and so you know, there will still be very tight supply. So between all of those tailwinds, there will be demand increase and price will go up. And listen, there are only about a million Bitcoin left to be mined between now and 2140. So no sovereign is going to build up a whole wealth fund by mining their own Bitcoin. They only want to mine Bitcoin as a way to transact and be able to, to transact Bitcoin and process transactions. And they are going to have to go in the open market and buy Bitcoin. <laughs> so I think as you add up all these things, there's reasonable, uh, you know, logic that supports an argument where by the end of this year, we should hopefully, and this is my personal opinion, it's not Marathon's official opinion, and this is not financial advice. Um, my personal opinion is that I think we will exceed the prior all-time high by the end of this year. There'll be a sell-off, uh, profit-taking, um, and then you'll see by the end of next year, will exceed that all-time high by potentially 2x.